Uh, hi everyone, um, welcome to this uh, FIMA CCG policy seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Jim Marston. Jim is the Vice President of the uh, Clean Energy Program at the Environmental Defense Fund and also Funding Director of the uh, EDF Texas Office. Um, the EDF, for those that do not know, is uh, one of the largest environmental organizations in the United States. Those activities contribute to um, progressing and uh, to the design of climate change policy intervention in the United States. Uh, today, Jim will talk about the recent development uh, of climate change policy in the US following the election of the new president, uh, Donald Trump. So the topic is uh, very relevant for us and also extremely timely. Uh, and it will be uh, the uh, occasion to discuss how the uh, situation can evolve and why not also uh, what can be our role in uh, overcoming these challenges. So uh, the seminar is organized as a discussion, so please feel free to intervene if you have questions or doubt. And um, as usual, there will be some room for uh, broader debate and curiosities at the end. Uh, for those that are following via GoToMeeting, please write questions, write your questions uh, in the chat, so we will try to address them at the end. And uh, thank you very much, Jim, for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you. I'm at the end, or almost the end, of four weeks in Italy. Uh, so let me say again, as a visitor, what a lovely country you have and how friendly the people are. Um, my wife is an Italian-American, her family's from Sicilia, and uh, we love coming here frequently. Um, it is a relevant topic to talk about climate change and Trump. Um, we are very hopeful that the Pope will try to talk about, to Donald Trump about climate. Uh, some of us think that only God can intervene to make him better, so let's hope the Pope can make some, have some influence there. Um, and obviously the G7 conference is coming up. Uh, let me, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about what I think Donald Trump is trying to do, why he's doing it, how we can s slow him down and stop him, but I also want to talk a little bit about what I think Europeans can do. Um, and uh, that will be probably the last 10 or 15 minutes of the talk. And probably the one that might have the most uh, interest in terms of questions. Uh, let me just say on behalf of Americans about Donald Trump, me dispiace. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, it is for those of us who have lived through many elections, it's very hard to understand. Um, I will try to, I, I will just simply say that you need to know he did not win a majority of the vote or even a plurality. He, he lost to Hillary Clinton by almost three million votes. And when you count the other candidates, he was uh, less than any president that's been elected in the last hundred years in terms of percentage. Uh, we had this ancient 16th century way of electing our president that makes no sense now, but it, it had this, ad, this very odd effect in this election. Let me tell you just a little bit more about EDF before I, and about me before I get into the substance. Uh, we were started in 1967. Uh, our first effort was to ban the pest, uh, insecticide uh, DDT, pesticide DDT. Uh, and from there we've taken on some of the hardest environmental issues, many in climate. Uh, the, the cap and trade idea that became part of the uh, uh, the uh, 
protocols uh, that the U.S. never adopted uh, came out of, uh, of uh, EDF. We worked on things like uh, working with corporations. McDonald's did away with their styrofoam containers because of a project we did. Uh, we, uh, we worked on the first car carbon dioxide standard in the world in California. Um, my history goes back to the founding of the Texas office, but I mostly worked on energy and climate. I uh, worked on the California car climate, uh, the climate, I'm sorry, the California car standards, the California comprehensive standard that we have in, in that state uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, afterwards, I can tell you stories about being the smoking tent uh, with him at the Capitol, a very odd experience. By the way, he's not very tall, which is also hard for me to understand. I thought he was a very big man. Uh, but also worked on issues of uh, climate and other environmental issues with regard to the North American Free Trade Agreement, the first big renewable portfolio standard in the country about renewable energy in Texas, and uh, fights against coal-powered plants across the country. Um, I would say what Trump's trying to do about uh, climate is very personal to us because much of what he's trying to undo are things we've worked on for the last 20 years. The clean power plan, the standard for uh, electric power plants is something that we designed with the government and pushed through. Um, we. Uh, the rules he's trying to undo with regard to methane, a short-term climate forcer, is again something we've led. And we are very involved in Paris, uh, the Paris Accord, and uh, are very sad that what was such a, a rational thing is under siege. But we're doing a lot of things. We have raised, uh, the only thing that, that good that happens when a president does anti-environmental gets elected in the U.S is we raise a whole lot of new money. We have two million members, and they give us a lot of money when they think the environment's under siege. Uh, we have a very big budget, $150 million last year. We probably will have raised 25 or maybe even 50 million more this year because of the reaction to Donald Trump. So we are a big organization. We have 550 employees around the country. We also have offices in uh, London, which was supposed to be an EU office. We haven't quite figured out what to do about that yet. If you have any ideas, please let us know. Uh, and we have an office in Beijing, uh, and we have an office in Mexico. And we have people scattered around the world doing other projects, some people in India and Indonesia, um, the Philippines. So uh, let's talk about uh, what he, the president's proposing. He's proposing to roll back many, many of the uh, rules or, or, or laws or even just ideas that were pending. Uh, you know about Paris, and I'll talk about that later. He's proposing to roll back the, the, the standard for power plants. I mentioned that. that that's only the beginning. He uh, is trying to, he proposes to cut the entire budget for the Environmental Protection Agency working on climate. Not a little bit, all of it. Uh, he has proposed to roll back the clean energy standards in the states. That'll be very hard to do. We're shocked he would do that because in theory, the Republicans are for local control and, and rail complaint against federal control, but he's going the opposite way. Uh, another surprise is he has proposed to slow down or stop the, the standards for uh, efficiency in automobiles, uh, a group of standards that the automobile manufacturers had agreed to and say they can meet. Um, and then he's even doing things like taking all the information that is on the government websites and taking it off and 
Um, fortunately, people downloaded it and and captured it before he's trying to hide it. That's that is a pretty incredible thing to do. And he's even doing away with programs like the Energy Star program that everybody is for because it saved us a half a trillion dollars in energy costs, making us more efficient, having equipment that that works better. Um, why he's against that, I do not know, other than he wants to be disruptive, maybe. Um, so let me make sure you know that Trump says a lot of things. He can't do a lot of things he's saying. You know, he said he was going to ban Muslims from coming into the country. Now, that's the courts have stopped him so far. He said he was going to uh, build a, a wall uh, and out to keep out Mexicans. Uh, the cost is like, now they think it's $60 billion, and even the Republican <laughs> Congress is giving him no money for it. And the same is true on the environment. He says he's done some executive orders. Uh, and the word executive order means something in the U.S. It's when the president says, in his realm of authority, we're going to do this. Like a policy for employment. Uh, an easy one is the President Obama said we were no longer allowed discrimination against um, gays and lesbians. That was in his authority. A lot of the things that Donald Trump has called executive orders are not those. They're kind of, I'm going to do this. And he pretends like that it's a big progress, but it's anybody who is a lawyer, and I'm a lawyer by training, uh, just like how, either you roll your eyes, do you all roll your eyes, like, and, 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 or you laugh at him, but he pretends like it's real action. Uh, now, he has proposed to roll back regulations, rules, what I call protections, but he can't just do it by himself. He has to go through a process. There'll have to be a rulemaking. They have to allow for comments. And the rules have to be based on facts. Uh, he has to have a basis. And if they're not based on facts, the courts will strike down those rules. And they can't be arbitrary, capricious, and they can't be contrary to facts. So it's going to be hard for him to roll back some of these, these things because the current record is so strong, and he has to deny science. Now, he has denied science on the campaign trail, but the law makes it hard for him to deny science. Uh, in the rulemaking. Uh, there are things, and he also has to stay in compliance with the laws passed by the, the Congress. Congress says the president has to do this, and the agencies have to do these other things, and if they don't do it, the courts can order them to do so, and if they don't follow the court orders, they can put them in in jail or prison for that. So it's not going to be as easy as he thinks. They do have some discretion. There are some things that will that he can do. Uh, for instance, the pledge of two billion dollars to the UN Green uh, Building Fund that was part of Paris. That money's gone. I'm afraid, um, and that obviously harms Paris a great deal. Um, and uh, we are looking at ways to try to overcome that. Um, I also want to tell you in the U.S. it's going to be hard to stop progress on climate because there are a number of things going on. Number one, we have a clean energy revolution. The amount of wind and solar that has been built in the last years, several years, is amazing. 65% of all new power plants in the country last year were wind and solar, no, no coal plants, some clean natural gas plants. Uh, the price, you probably know the price of renewables around the world, but particularly in the U.S., has fallen dramatically. Uh, last year alone, uh, wind declined by 66%. Uh, over the last four years, solar prices have dropped 400%. Uh, Renewable energy in the U.S. is very competitive with fossil fuel. People like it. Um, 
Trump uh, has problems in the sense that Americans don't like his policies on the environment. Uh, Sixty-one percent oppose his policy on the environment, and over half of his voters oppose what he's trying to do on the environment. Uh, that makes it hard to actually do things. If um, Trump can slow down renewable technology, he can make it more expensive, but he can't stop it. In the end, uh, just like the companies who tried to, the old telephone company in the U.S. who tried to stop cell phones, failed miserably, went bankrupt trying to do that, he will not be able to stop the technology or the market forces. Um, the other thing that's going on is the United States is not only a federal government, but it's also a big government of, of states. I'm from Texas, a big state. Uh, I'm sure you all have images of Texas. No, I don't own a horse. I, I do own a cowboy hat uh, and cowboy boots, but I don't ride horses, at least not very often. Uh, but the states have a lot of power, and so do the cities. And many states are going forward with clean energy and with climate commitments. Big states like New York and uh, California and, and Massachusetts and Oregon and Minnesota and many others have really strong policies on climate. And many other states like Texas have not direct climate policies but clean energy, renewable energy projects that have the effect of reducing greenhouse gases dramatically. And a lot of cities have stepped up, particularly after Trump said he was going to stop climate and say, we're going to make progress. And we're going to, we're going to, to reduce our emissions and have our citizens reduce emissions. And it's not just in states like California that are known for environmental regulations, but places like in, in Georgia, Atlanta, uh, cities in Texas like Houston, the oil capital of the world, have big climate commitments and are going to 100% renewable energy. So we're going to make some real progress. Uh, there's an interesting book by Mayor Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York, uh, written with the former head of Sierra Club about how cities can save the planet. Uh, and I think a lot of cities in the U.S. are, are, are planning to follow that. I'll tell you uh, that cities have made commitments uh, to buy large numbers of electric vehicles that are going to make a big difference in the U.S. because we drive so far and so many big cars. So that, that will make a difference. Um, I will uh, say that I think that's something that you and other NGOs in the in Europe can do. Uh, number one, you ought to be talking about what cities and states are doing and don't, I want you to know that you're not alone. The U.S. has not abandoned climate commitments, even if Donald Trump is trying to do at the federal level. And the states have lots of power. They control all the, rate, the electricity rules. So there's a lot of things we can do, do regardless of Trump. Uh, we ought to look for opportunities to work with cities and states. They want to work with Europe. And if you have strategies, policies, technologies you want to share, share it with them. And if you want them to share ideas about planning or transportation or uh, electric vehicles, I know that's not a big issue here in, in Venice, but it's a big issue in Milano. I know that. It, they, they will be willing to help you too. So you ought to be working with Americans and American cities and states. The other thing I want you to know is the corporations business in the U.S. by and large is still committed to going forward. Many of them had made commitments during the Obama time and most of them have reaffirmed them. They're going and they're doing it because number one they believe in climate change and number two it makes economic sense. Renewable energy is um, very competitive in the U.S. Energy efficiency saves money. That's easy to do. And they see the trend and they want to be on the right side of history. So again, I would encourage you to, to work with these companies, look at them. 
I can tell you yesterday, a big electric utility in that owns a lot of coal plants in the Midwest, in, in Michigan, a state that, that Trump won, surprisingly, uh, DTE committed to reduce its greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050, going to only gas and renewables and, and not building any more and shutting down the coal plants. That's in the heart of Trump country, where his policies could be there to help keep their coal plants running, they said no. And there's and lots of companies, big companies, many of them the high tech companies, or many are uh, also the big industrial companies like General Electric and other companies who make energy intensive uh, products. So that's an opportunity for you and us to work with them. I will tell you, EDF. My program is focusing a lot of energy in, in new ways to work with companies or new ways to evaluate companies. We're going to do a, a grade system. Students in school get grades A through F. A is the best and F is the worst. Uh, based on their performance, we're going to do a grading system for electric utilities. Which ones are the best on both policy and their performance? products and try to get people to move to, to, to companies, reward companies that are doing good things and also work with them on, on projects. All right, so I want to talk about Paris. Um, and if you watch closely, uh, you don't know what Trump's doing because he doesn't know. Um, there's, no there's no plan. Uh, I don't know if this is true, but when I was growing up, I was told that ducks could not remember the next day, and every day is a new day. And, uh, and I think Donald Trump's a little bit like a duck. He wakes up, and every day things a new day. Uh, it's who talked to him last. Uh, I don't know where it's going to end up. Uh, there was an article that I read recently that Donald Trump's daughter will prevail. She's very much pro-climate work and pro-staying in Paris. And the military in the U.S. is for that. And the oil company Secretary of State is for that. On the other hand, there are a lot of folks on their ideological the other side. I, and I read an article yesterday that said this is why Donald Trump will do badly on Paris, and that's because these um, you can call them very conservative folks. They border on neo-fascists. They were like Le Pen uh, in, and, or the Hungarian president. They, and they actually talk. Uh, and it's part of this. They think there's conspiracies everywhere, including on, on climate science. that's made up uh, to control people. So I don't always want to end up, but I do have some ideas about what you all can do. Maybe with us, but also without us. Uh, now you need to understand Trump's, in addition to him saying that, that climate change science is a hoax or made up by the Chinese, and he's kind of, and nobody's been able to figure out where that comes from. Even when you ask him, he can't tell you. Uh, but apart from that, the reason why, the almost rational reason why he is, wants the U.S. out of Paris is because he says it is unfair to U.S. corporations. And that basis is basically comparing the U.S. to the obligations of China and India. Uh, U.S. made commitments to reduce uh, total greenhouse gases and do so fairly quickly. And China and India made commitments which are actually very big and very important, but only to dramatically reduce energy intensity or greenhouse gas intensity. Uh, and some that's unfair, uh, so says the president. Uh, 
he, uh, but he, of course, ignores the fact that the U.S. is by far the largest contributor to the total greenhouse gas that's in the atmosphere now. We've done it for a long time, and we got a free ride, and maybe we owe something to the world. Uh, he also ignores the fact that we had the highest per capita per person greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I don't know the numbers for Italy, uh, but I know the uh, U.S. puts out 20 times, each U.S. citizen generates 20 times more greenhouse gas than a, an Indian living today. The number is not as much for China, but still a big number. And I, I can't remember the number, it's two or three times per capita of, of people living in Europe. Uh, but in any event, so we're a big part of the problem. Now the other thing, of course, is, is politics. He made these crazy claims that he was going to bring back coal jobs in America. Um, by the way, there are not very many coal jobs in America. There are like 70,000 coal jobs in America. There are a million, no, two million clean energy jobs in America, and those are the ones that are growing. And I, I think this is okay because you and your, you Europeans are less prudish than us, but my favorite comparison of jobs uh, is there are more exotic dancers in the U.S. than there are, are coal miners. Uh, you know. And our economy would not crash or be harmed if we didn't have exotic dancing. <laughs> uh, it just is not a very important part of our economy. Uh, but they are in a few states that he won, and he used it as uh, part of his overall campaign that the past is being lost. It's part of a theme. Part of it was racism. Part of it was appealing to older folks versus younger folks and people in the rural areas versus the cities. A little bit like the Brexit vote, I think. And he actually praised Brexit, and he can't, he used some of their ideas. So, uh, but in any event, uh, he uh, now main, mainly is saying that it's unfair to U.S. business. Uh, he ignores the fact it's really easy for us to comply. Uh, all we really need to do is become a little more efficient, like like uh, Europe, and just have the rest of the country adopt renewable energy that we have in Texas and Iowa, two states that he won, by the way. Uh, but my idea uh, is not an idea that I came up with, but it's an idea that I think Europeans ought to be talking about now. And if he goes through with the idea of pulling back on Paris, uh, but Trump ought to know that this is going to happen. Uh, and even if he just dramatically reduces the commitment, this ought to be done. There's something called the border, border adjustment measures. Uh, the interesting idea is that he, Trump has been using this as an idea for Mexico uh, to try to help our industry there, but uh, the border adjustment measure was a provision in the 2010 uh, bill that passed the House of Representatives but did not pass the Senate, did not become law, with regard to climate. And it was an answer to what if we reduce our greenhouse gases and China and India won't, and they'll even be more at an advantage over our, our industry. So the idea was to use a border adjustment measure, and that uh, is the idea that basically 
you, with a tariff, you deal with the, what it would have cost to comply with the U.S. law if you're in the U.S. The bill is called Waxman Markey uh, or the Paris Accord. And it also reduces the incentive of companies to leave a country that is complying with a greenhouse gas limit to go to another country to reduce cost. And it gives countries that are not yet having a law an incentive to pass their own greenhouse gas law. So uh, I would tell you that uh, that it's not just a U.S. idea to do this. The former President Sarkozy of France uh, has floated this idea and said we ought to do this. And if the U.S. pulls out of, of Paris to try to make its co companies have an advantage and not worry about the impact on the global climate, then we ought to have a trade measure called a border adjustment measure. And I won't go into all the details, but, uh, but how it works, it, but it's, uh, it is a tariff. And what you do is a talk about, uh, decide what are the covered goods, what are the products that it will apply to. You don't, for ease of administration and cost, you don't need to worry about uh, trading things like agriculture or software, but energy intensive things, things that have a lot of semen in them or um, steel or use a lot of ele electricity in the making or other um, fuels, um, oil and gas would be covered. So those are the covered goods. And, and then the way you look at it is, has the country that is exporting to, your, to you, do they have comparable action, was the words that were used in, in um, the waxman Markey bill. Do they have something that's a lot alike? And if you're part of Paris, then that, that obviously is there. If you're not, and you don't have other things, uh, other regulation that that requires your industries to reduce their greenhouse gases, then that mean, that's when the border adjustment measure would come into flux. So let me, I would love in the next few days and weeks of Donald Trump is saying he's going to stay in, no he's not, going back and forth, that there be some some uh, stories coming out of Europe. If he drops out, we are going to, to not let him get an advantage for our companies. Now, I think it first ought to start with the NGO community. In quotes and in writing papers, uh, there have been some papers written about this, uh, but talking to your government. Uh, I wish the governments would step up and say that. It appears they think Donald Trump is a little unstable or a duck, and they're afraid to make you angry, so they're not wanting to threaten that right now. I don't. I think actually threats are something he understands. But in any event, if they can't say that out loud now, they ought to say it at the G7 in Sicily in a few days. They ought to be saying it at the NATO meeting uh, and, and, and then be saying it in private meetings with him. I know the governments are having private meetings with the Trump administration about this, urging uh, them to, the Trump administration to say in Paris. I think they ought to have uh, what we call things carrots and sticks. Carrots are you what you feed folks to be nice to them, but we also think you ought to have sticks. Uh, this comes to horses, you know, you feed horses carrots, but if they won't behave, you also have a stick. Trump needs to have some sticks, and industry needs to have some sticks in the United States that they know 
that this will not be good for them and there'll be tariffs put on their products. So uh, I know you have many contacts across Europe. You all are researchers, but I we need to have more than Sarkozy saying this idea out loud. And then if it comes to pass, or if he dramatically reduces the obligation of, that we ha have committed to, then we ought to have a prorated pro some additional fee, not as much as we get out entirely, put on our products because we are, we are playing the game. And let me complicate it for you a little bit, uh, which is, remember I talked about cities and states are doing good things? Uh, so what I would love us to figure out together is how to say we're going to have a border adjustment measure applied to U.S. goods that are covered, but if they're manufactured in states, or cities that have comparable uh, commitments, where we are doing climate even outside of Paris, then those goods from the state of California or New York or from Austin, Texas, where I'm from, uh, do not have that border measure. And that we, you are rewarding, you are working with the part of the the America that is trying to do our fair share on climate. Um, I do think that this idea, I have not seen anybody say the idea that you could break it down by regions, by, by cities, but um, I think it fits with what um, Mayor Bloomberg's book says about cities being able to solve the problems and we don't want to reward U.S. cities who stepped forward in spite of Trump. So that's an idea that I would like, uh, if we can get a general conversation about border adjustment measures, that we begin together to think about if it's possible to do that, and if so, how we would do that, how we would do it. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm at one minute longer than I had hoped to go, because I want to have questions and comments. I probably talked in a way that didn't allow you to interrupt. I'm sorry, I wanted to interrupt along the way, but I'd like, uh, I want to hear from you. And I want this to be the first of an ongoing conversation and work together between the Environmental Defense Fund and your two organizations and others that you have contact with in Europe because frankly, we cannot rely upon our government, working with your governments to do this. And, we, and time is too short, the threat's too great for us to wait four years <laughs> for a new president. So we have, to, we have to do something now, and these are some ideas I think I have, and I want to hear your ideas. So thank you for having me.